Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift of life, the gift of prayer, to be able to approach your throne at any moment. And as we open thy word, we are asking for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. We are in great need of the early and the latter rain. So please, shower us with blessings from on high, is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When we look at the word of God, I want you to write in your notes, Mark 10, verse 31. Again, Mark chapter 10, verse 31. There the Bible says, for the first shall be last and the last shall be first. If we are studying the mark of the beast, then we need to look at scripture at the first time when there was a mark placed upon someone. We're in the last book of the Bible with Revelation 14 concerning the mark of the beast. And we need to look at the first time in scripture we see the mark of the beast. Why? The Bible says that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. That's Mark 10 verse 31. That thought is repeated all through the gospels. And when I say the gospels, that means Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the gospels. <clears throat> Therefore, as we are now in the book of Genesis, chapter 4, we're going to see the first time a mark was placed upon someone. You have Cain and Abel. These were two men that were children of Adam and Eve. And they each brought an offering to the Lord. I want you to read this, to go back and read it in your own time. Cain brought an offering of fruit and Abel brought an offering of a lamb. One brought an offering according to his own mind or what he felt was appropriate, and the other brought an offering according to what God requested. One was a sacrifice of works, the other was a sacrifice of faith. The Bible says, ye shall know them by their fruits. In other words, you will know them by their works. You will know them by what they do. In the Bible, fruit represents works. It represents action, the fruit that you bear. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Therefore, the revelation of Cain yielding fruit as a sacrifice, which was not what God requested, was not a sacrifice of faith. They each came to worship God. One came according to his own will. One came according to the will of God. And because Cain refused to follow the word of God, notice what God did. We're in Genesis 4, and come with me to verse 15. Speaking of Cain, we're in Genesis 4, in verse 15 it says, And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. So what did God do? God set a mark upon Cain. And this had to do with worship. And we know that the mark of the beast has to do with worship. When you read Revelation 13, verse 15 through 17, those verses are very clear that it has to do with worship. Therefore, we see the first example of where God places a mark upon someone. And many today are worshiping God, but they're not worshiping God according to the word of God. They're following tradition. They're following what they were taught. They're following man and not actually following the word of God. So that's our first example, Cain and Abel. Let's write that on the board. Cain and Abel. The Bible says, that which hath been, it is that which shall be, and there is nothing new under the sun. History always repeats. This thought is 
or this principle is taught in Ecclesiastes 1.9 and Ecclesiastes 3.15. You see these principles in God's word. Let us move on. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 5. Exodus chapter 5. Here you have the second example in scripture concerning dealing with the mark of the beast. Now, when you study the mark of the beast in Revelation 13 and 14, it's clearly a law that the government passes that is against the law of God. It is a law. We've established that in our previous studies. If you've missed the image of the beast study, if you've missed the mark of the beast study, please get in contact with us. We will email that to you. Now, whenever you see governments oppressing the people of God, you'll see in scripture that God will allow natural disasters to fall to judge that nation. Or God will allow another nation to attack and chastise that nation by, because they implemented laws that were in opposition to God's law. Let me give you an example. We're in Exodus 5. Here's our example with Pharaoh in Egypt with Moses. Exodus 5 and verse 1 and 2, it says, And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in, and Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. The audacity of this man. But understand that to hold a feast means to go and keep a holy day. It means to go and worship the Lord. Pharaoh implemented laws that were prohibiting the people of God from worshiping God. And by his rebellion, it brought on the plagues, the plague of water turning to blood, the plague of lice, the plague of frogs, the plague of darkness. All these plagues came because he refused to follow the word of God and he passed laws that were oppressing the people of God and preventing them from worshiping the Lord the way the word says to worship the Lord. So as a result, Egypt was hit with natural disasters. Egypt was hit with natural disasters as a result. What do we have? Natural disasters in Egypt as a result of disregarding God's word and oppressing the people of God. Let's go to another example. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Now, you'll need to read Daniel 3, 4, and 5 to really grasp the fullness of what we're going to say here in regards to God judging Babylon and Babylon's laws that were in opposition to God's law. We know that Babylon passed a law telling everyone to bow down to the image when the music was played. Now, this law that was passed was idolatry. This law was forced worship. And this law opposed God's law. And the three Hebrew worthies, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, decided they were going to worship the Lord even if it would cost them their lives. That's faith. Are you willing to lay down your life for the gospel? Are you willing to die for Christ? Christ died for you. You should be willing to be a martyr for Jesus if you have accepted Christ as your personal savior. He gave his life. Why should we not be willing to lay down our lives? Do we love ourselves too much? In Daniel 3, we see that they passed a law that was in opposition to God's law. That's number one. 
in chapter 4 of Daniel because of Nebuchadnezzar's pride. And pride is when you say, my way is better than God's way. It was pride that led Nebuchadnezzar to erect an all gold image when in Daniel 2, he had a dream that the image was not all gold. In other words, God was telling him, your kingdom is not going to last forever. But because of his pride, he was saying, my kingdom will last forever. It was pride. And because of his pride, God humbled him and turned him into a beast for seven years. Why did God turn him into the beast? Because God is showing you that Babylon is the beast of Bible prophecy. That's what God is showing you. And we've studied both of those already in previous presentation. If you have not, and you would like to watch them, get in contact with us. We will email or text you the link to those videos so you can watch them. So again, Babylon is the beast of Bible prophecy. And the mark of the beast will soon be enforced. To get back to Daniel 4, so it was the pride that led him to erect such an image. Because of Babylon's passing laws that would oppress God's people and the pride of the nation going contrary to the word of God, as we see in America with the LGBT movement, going contrary and calling it Pride Day and Pride Month. It's a clear indication you're in opposition to God, to you be even using the word pride. In Daniel 5, God allows Medo-Persia to invade Babylon and chastise Babylon, and Babylon's kingdom falls as a result. So in Babylon, what did you have? You had an invasion. Was the judgment of God because you passed the law that oppressed the people of God. An invasion of, a, of an adversary. An invasion of an adversary. And as a result, the kingdom collapsed. So we've dealt with two nations thus far. Next, let's go to the time of Christ. Let's go to Matthew 27. Matthew 27. And again, we've already established the principle of the first shall be last and the last shall be first. What, as we study the first coming of Jesus, whatever happened at the first coming must be repeated at the second coming. The first shall be last and the last first. So as we study the first coming of Christ, notice what happened at the first coming of Christ. Let us pick up in verse 45 when Jesus died. Now, when we look at the fact that Christ died, what caused Christ to die? It was the union of church, scribes and Pharisees, and the state, Herod and Pilate, and the two united, and it resulted in the persecution of Jesus Christ, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Church and state came together and passed a law to condemn an innocent man. Same thing happened in Egypt, and the same thing is coming again with the mark of the beast in the future. So we see in Matthew 27 and verse 45, what was the result of this law to crucify Christ as church and state united? What happened as a result? There were natural disasters. Notice what it says, Matthew 27 and verse 45, it says, now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. So there was what? There was darkness. Was that all that happened? Well, let's skip down to verse 50 and read some more. We'll read also verse 51. Notice what happened. It says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, 
and the rocks rent. So what else do you have? You have darkness. You have an earthquake. These are natural disasters. Natural disasters. So here you have the crucifixion. We'll just put Rome. And what happened? Natural disasters. This is so important because now as we get to the next presentation, we see that there was a dark day when church and state united as a result that led to the persecution of Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 25 and verse 40, he says, if you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 25 and verse 40. In other words, God is telling us, if you oppress my people, I'm going to judge you. If you oppress my son, I'm going to judge you. There's no difference, which shows that God loves us like he loved his son. Because he was willing to give his son so that we might have eternal life. It's a beautiful thing when you really consider what the father has done on our behalf. And the fact that he will defend his children. Now, as we go a step further, we've dealt with three nations thus far, showing natural disasters, an invasion, and natural disasters. Let us now come over to this dark day that is yet future and what the Bible has to say in Luke 21 and verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. Put that in your mind so you don't forget it. With perplexity, we're going to see that word again. The sea and the waves roaring. So notice that it says signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and it mentions with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring. The sign in the heavens is talking about the coming dark day, and on that same day there will be water destruction. Why do we know that? Because there's other verses that put the two together where there's darkness in the heavens and a tsunami that strikes a nation. Very important that we consider these things. So he specifically mentioned with perplexity. Where do we see this in scripture where a law is passed, a law is passed and it mentions with perplexity and the law is against God's people. Esther chapter three, Esther chapter three, and many of you are familiar with the decree against the Jews where Haman deceived the king into signing this law that would condemn and kill the Jews on a specific day. And then Esther, who was in that position for such a time as this, as Mordecai told her, and once the writing of the law was distributed. Notice what happened. We're in Esther 3, verse 14 and 15. Esther 3, verse 14 and 15. Notice what the Bible says. The copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people that they should be ready against that day. The post went out being hastened by the king's commandment, and the decree was given in Shushan, the palace, and the king and Haman sat down to drink. But the city, Shushan, was perplexed. They were what? They were perplexed. Perplexity, remember we read that? Jesus tied the dark day to perplexity. Let's keep reading. Notice what else happened. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry. Notice that, a loud and bitter cry, the loud cry. Verse two, and came even before the king's gate for none might enter into the king's gate 
clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So notice that they are weeping, mourning, laying in sackcloth as a result of this law that was passed against them. Hmm. Let's see if we see some of the same terminology about sackcloth, weeping, mourning, with a dark day. Comparing scripture with scripture, let us turn in our Bibles to Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8. Now you've already seen three examples where laws were passed that oppressed the people of God, and the result was natural disasters. The result was an invasion. The result was natural disasters. Well, when the mark of the beast is enforced, we're going to see natural disasters and an invasion. And we're going to allow the Bible to prove that for us. Notice what it says. Again, we're in Amos chapter 8, beginning in verse 8. It says, Shall not the land tremble for this? And every one mourn that dwelleth therein, and it shall rise up holy as a flood, and it shall be cast out and drowned as by the flood of Egypt, and it shall come to pass in that day. So notice it mentioned the, an earthquake. It said the land tremble. That's an earthquake. Then it mentioned the water rising up as a flood, and it shall be cast out and drowned as by the flood. That's a tsunami. Then it says, and it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. So what are these natural disasters? Number one, we have earthquake. Next, we have a flood slash tsunami. Next, we have a dark day, darkness, this, the light, the sun goes down at noon is what it says in verse 9. Now let's read verse 10. It says, and I will turn your feast into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. And I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins and baldness upon every head. And I will make it as the mourning of an only son and the end thereof as a bitter day. Is not verse 10 the same terminology that we read in Esther chapter 4 when they were weeping and mourning and laying in sackcloth because of the law that was just passed? These similarities are not by chance, not by chance. So what do we see here? Earthquake, flood, dark day. Some of you may have missed it, all these happen on the same day. I'm not saying it the same day that the law is passed, but these natural disasters all happen on the same day. Notice what it says in verse 9. It says, and it shall come to pass in that day. That's very clear. These things happen on the same day. These natural disasters happen on the same day. Let us now turn in our Bibles to the book of Amos 5 and verse 8. Amos 5 and verse 8 is another passage that puts together a sign in the heaven, a dark day, with water destruction. Amos 5 and verse 8, these passages are still yet future, have not been fulfilled yet. It says, Seek him that maketh the seven stars, and Orion, and turneth the shadow of death into the morning, and make it the day dark with night. That's a dark day. That calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. So notice you have first a dark day. Then it mentions the water destruction. That's flood. That's three passages now. Jesus said it in Luke 21, 25. Then we saw Amos 8. Now, Amos 5. Let's go to Isaiah 5 now, and notice what it says there in verse, we'll actually start in verse 26. We'll start in verse 26. 
Why? Because it mentions God's sign. And we know that God's sign is the Sabbath. And many people unknowingly are worshiping on Sunday when the Bible actually says we should worship on Saturday. Notice what it says as it talks about this crisis of the Sunday law in Isaiah 5 and verse 26. And he will lift up an ensign to the nations from far, and I will hiss unto them from the end of the earth. Behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. None shall be weary, nor stumble among them. None shall slumber nor sleep, neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the latchet of their shoes be broken, whose arrows are sharp and all their bows bent. Their horses' hoofs shall be counted like flint, and their wheels like a whirlwind. When you see horses and chariots, bows, arrows, whirlwind, all signify war in Scripture. All of them signify war in Scripture. And there will be a war very soon on American soil when China and Russia invade America and attack the White House. You're going to see this happen all on the dark day, which is still yet future. And God will allow these calamities as a result of the passing of the Sunday law because it will represent the darkness that America has fallen into by denying the light of God's word concerning the true Sabbath. Isaiah 5 and verse 29, it says, Their roaring shall be like a lion, they shall roar like young lions, yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey and shall carry it away safe and none shall deliver it. In the Bible, roaring represents prophesying. You can write down Jeremiah 25 and verse 30 and also Amos 3, verse 6 through 8. Amos 3, 6 through 8, roaring represents prophesying. Verse 30 says, and in that day, they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if one look unto the land, behold darkness and sorrow, and the light is darkened in the heavens thereof. Notice it mentioned the roaring of the sea, water destruction, and the light darkened in the heavens on the day that war takes place when China and Russia invade America. Well, some may say, well, how do you know China and Russia are going to invade? Well, brothers and sisters, God has given prophetic dreams. And if we believe Joel 2, if we believe Acts 2, where it talks about the last revival of the Lord, God is going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh and sons and daughters shall prophesy. The other city to be destroyed is that of Tampa Bay, Florida. Tampa Bay, if you know somebody living in Tampa, they need to move and understand that God has given these prophecies so that we may understand the truth concerning his seventh day Sabbath, which we call Saturday, which is to be honored and reverenced as we prepare for the soon return of Jesus.